Okay, great. Uh, it's seven o'clock, I think, in the UK. And so I think we'll start this webinar. Um, we've got some people joining in, so we're just waiting a little bit of time um, just as people join. I'll start an introduction, though, um, before we move on to Anna. Um, my name is Richard Artingsall. I'm director of teleconsulting for VETCT. And um, we're doing a series of specialist webinars every two weeks over the next uh, year, sort of six months um, to showcase our specialist team. Uh, and the team is um, for case consultancy in practice. Um, and we work with general practitioners, referral centers, and anybody managing cases. Um, so quick questions, more complex cases. And our specialist team is here to help you. It's really easy to create cases. Um, we give you um, 12 to 24 hour written advice, tech support, uh, asynchronous tech support if you're working through your day, and also the ability to have an appointment with a specialist at your convenient time as well. So all of that is through the website and through the app. Um, if you're not familiar with the consultancy support and our specialist team, then please do um, have a look at our services as well. So a bit of an introduction to VETCT now. Anna, do you mind moving the slide on? So for those that don't know VETCT, I'm sure you'll do because you're here. Um, VETCT was set up by Victoria Johnson and Julian um, <coughs> Labore. Um, we have a global team of over 200 veterinary specialists and um, our core functions are to support people in practice with exceptional radiology, case consultancy for those difficult case advice and educational services as well. So today, obviously, consultancy services. Um, if you click, if you scan the QR code there, you'll get some more information. Essentially, it's supporting you with written specialist advice, 12 to 24 hours. Um, so that security that you know you will speak to a specialist, you will have that support through your cases, um, and you can work with your clients in practice, knowing that we've got our specialist team on your shoulder as an extension of your team. So next slide, if you can. So just a bit of housekeeping. I think everyone's going to be muted in the um, webinar today. There is a chat function if you've got any questions, and hopefully we'll have 15-minute Q&A as well. And this is being recorded as well. Uh, so yeah, next one. So I'm really pleased to um, uh, introduce Anna, who's one of our team here, Anna Nemec. Um, she's a double-boarded European and American specialist in veterinary dentistry, currently teaches at the University of Ljubljana, and is one of our um, consultants here at VETCT, um, dealing with all sorts of dentistry cases that come in all the time. Um, it's really good to have her here. And she's gonna be talking today on dental emergencies in our veterinary world. So over to you, Anna. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, VETCT, for this opportunity to be part of the team and to talk about dentistry, which is obviously my favorite subject. Uh, welcome, everyone, and I'm really happy that uh, we are here in such a nice number. Uh, and um, as you, we will see, um, there are not really many real emergencies, life-threatening emergency situations in veterinary dentistry, but definitely there are um, conditions or situations where delay uh, in our um, approach to these patients may really cause these patients suffer pain uh, and even long-term complications with their uh, food prehension, for example. So when we talk about real life-threatening emergency in, uh, in terms of oral cavity diseases, um, there are some, and one of such is, for example, difficulties breathing due to, for example, large sialocyles, tumors, or any other swelling in the area of the caudal oral cavity and uh, throat uh, and neck. And the other one is uh, severe bleeding. And you can see from these um, images here that this Labrador was bleeding pretty severely from a single uh, wound in at the mesial aspect of the canine, um, there was a deep pocket due to periodontitis, um, and it seems like the small, the relatively small artery that was there was uh, affected, causing this severe bleeding. So yes, periodontal disease, despite being obviously first of all most common oral disease and probably one of the most common diseases in general, uh, it and it being chronic disease, it can also become absolutely acute and a life-threatening disease. There is another case, this was a smaller dog, 
um, that came in need, in need of transfusion uh, because of severe oral bleeding. And the reason was actually se a severe periodontitis at the level of mandibular fourth premolar and first molar, uh, which um, actually transected or damaged the inferior alveolar artery. Um, and that is why we went in and actually treated this chronic disease on an emergency basis, uh, removed the teeth, ligate the vessel, and suture in a routine manner, and that took care of the oral bleeding. So yes, oral diseases can present also as life-threatening conditions or situations, but most commonly we are, more commonly we are dealing with uh, situations where we have at least few hours, if not a few days, to uh, actually... Um, address the problem. Uh, when we talk about most common, uh, what is considered dental emergencies, these are definitely uh, traumatic de dental velar injuries. Um, these are considered injuries to the tooth itself or to the tooth supporting apparatus uh, and usually result from direct traumatic force. The most common type of uh, traumatic dental velar injuries are complicated crown fractures. That means that uh, crown is fractured and pulp, uh, dental pulp is exposed. Uh, most commonly, these injuries will occur in the maxilla and will affect so-called strategic, strategic teeth, which means maxillary and mandibular canine teeth and maxillary fourth premolar teeth and mandibular first molar teeth. Um, most commonly, these, actually, these injuries actually go unnoticed, but if the client notices the problem, then this should be um, addressed immediately. So generally, when we talk about dental velar injuries, I mentioned before, we talk about uh, dental fractures and periodontal trauma. Dental fractures are much more common than periodontal trauma, and they are classified in different categories depending on what part of the tooth is involved. Is this either crown, crown and root, or root? And uh, the other part of classification uh, relates to pulp exposure. So pulp may not be exposed or pulp can be exposed. Um, and when we talk about uh, most common emergencies, we talk about complicated crown fracture, means that the crown is fractured and dental pulp is involved. However, do not underestimate um, fractures where pulp is not exposed, meaning enamel fractures and uncomplicated crown fractures, because um, with these fractures, dentinal tubules are exposed and dentinal tubules are actually big enough for bacteria and other noxious stimuli to enter but pulp and cause um, inflammation and infection of the pulp. And it has been shown for fourth premolar teeth on the maxilla that about 25% of the maxillary fourth premolar teeth, even if the pulp is not involved in a fracture, they will become non-vital. Uh, but what we will be focusing on today is actually complicated crown fracture. Um, and this is a scenario that we see here for um, mandibular canine tooth. Uh, it's obvious that the pulp is involved and there is bleeding from the open pulp cavity. So if we leave that, that as is, so if we leave this untreated, or if let's say this goes unnoticed, then this pulp will become uh, inevitably inflamed, infected, and eventually non-vital. Um, and here are the two histological images. The upper one shows non-vital pulp, and the lower one shows this is the apex of the tooth with apical delta, so it's a uh, major tooth, uh, with periapical inflammation, which is uh, the result of spread of the infection and inflammation from a uh, from an affected um, exposed pulp. So what do we do? Why do we call this, uh, this uh, condition an emergency? Uh, because within 48 hours, uh, it was shown for the uh, major teeth, so teeth that have um, uh, formed apex, um, that within 48 hours, we can actually um, save this teeth uh, by save this teeth vitality quite successfully if we correctly treat them. And what does that mean? Uh, we would actually do um, vital pulpectomy, which means that we would literally amputate the upper five to seven millimeters of the pulp, then place medication, which is most commonly nowadays uh, MTA, directly on the pulp and then restore the tooth uh, with two different materials. One is glass ionomer layer and the other one, the top one is composite layer. And the success rate of such treated tooth is about 90% if we really do it within 48 hours. 
Um, it used to, this procedure also used to be done with calcium hydroxide, but it was shown that calcium hydroxide, it's much less um, effective or it's less consistently reliable in keeping vitality of these teeth. So nowadays we are moving away from it, from it and using mostly MTA. Um, it is, however, extremely important that we follow these cases up, that we do radiographic rechecks in these cases, because um, uh, the procedure may fail, as we mentioned, and it's about 10 to 15 percent failure rate. Um, so we really need to uh, have the client on board that if we do vital pulpectomy or any other endodontic treatment, we have to follow these cases up. And ideally, or by the book, we should follow with radiographic rechecks three months, six months, 12 months after the procedure, and then annually. Um, at least one radiographic recheck has to be done. Um, so, and this is what we are looking at. So upper two radiographic images uh, are showing a vital pulpectomy immediately post-procedure, so before waking the patient up, and lower two images are showing the same two, the same animal five months later. So what do we see? We see continuous um, development of the tooth, so pulp is narrowing down because dentin is being laid down by um, vital odontoblasts. Uh, and we see no periapical uh, lesion compared to the immediate post-operative uh, radiograph. So that means this tooth has most likely survived and will most likely be okay long-term. However, as we mentioned, long-term follow-ups are very, very um, uh, welcome or indicated. And vital pulpectomy can be a huge failure even without noticing anything on the outside. So this uh, radiograph shows us a fourth premolar that was previously treated with vital pulpectomy. Um, the procedure was done within 24 hours. Everything went well. Um, the client didn't notice any problems with the dog uh, and the tooth looked perfectly fine on the outside. Yet we can see uh, that was five months later as well. We can see that this tooth is not vital. We can see large, well-defined periapical lesions affecting all three roots of this fourth premolar. And at this point, we decided to extract the tooth and we can see all of the roots with this um, abscess granulation tissue um, at the apices indicating non-vitality and infection, not just of the pulp, but also of the periapical uh, tissues. Uh, it is also uh, obviously important to know that vital uh, that there are alternatives to vital pulpectomy, um, and there are several reasons when we would not elect vital pulpectomy. And the first one is if there is uh, severe dental damage. So complicated deep crown root fractures are not good candidates for endodontic treatment. So we will elect extraction in these cases. If we have an animal with underlying conditions, diseases, or if the client just doesn't want another anesthesia for radiographic recheck of the endodontic treatment, then we would also elect extraction. And we would also elect extraction of um, fractured deciduous teeth. Uh, in these cases, obviously, this is not an emergency. We will do this procedure as soon as possible, um, and we would prescribe pain medications until we extract the tooth, but it's not considered, obviously, an emergency. Then dental abscesses, which are a sequel of, of what we were just talking right now uh, of uh, endodontic disease. Um, so dental abscesses, that those may differ. And when we have a patient with uh, limited or um, located uh, swelling below the eye and even a draining tract, this is most consistently most consistent with a uh, um, dental disease from the maxillary fourth premolar tooth. So if this swelling is limited to an area, if there is draining, if the patient is otherwise doing well, there is no uh, leukocytosis, no fever, then these are not considered emergencies. Basically, these, these uh, abscesses are draining and um, this uh, can be, should be done as soon as possible, but again, it's not considered an emergency. On the other hand, we can see these two patients here, those are acute swellings. They uh, develop within a few hours, um, and both of these patients also did not feel well. One of them had also fever. Um, that is obviously different. But these dental disease, these dental abscesses should be addressed as soon as possible, and these are considered emergencies, uh, meaning that I would like to do them the same, the same or latest the next day. Um, and if we cannot do them immediately, 
uh, meaning the same day ideally or late is the next warning, then actually this should be uh, treated by antibiotics because they may actually de develop into a more widespread infection. Going to the other topic of uh, traumatic dental alveolar injury, which is um, periodontal trauma. Periodontal trauma is actually a real emergency. These, uh, these uh, situations, these lesions should be addressed ideally within three hours. And if the tooth is uh, saved in an appropriate uh, solution medium, um, up to six hours. Um, obviously what happens with periodontal trauma is that periodontal attachment is severe. Uh, also alveolus may or may not be fractured, but the teeth themselves remain intact. Um, and um, these lesions or these situations can range from simple concussion and subluxation, which most commonly go unnoticed, to obviously luxations. Uh, luxations can be lateral, like in uh, this case on this image. They can also be uh, extrusive, so the tooth is pulled out of the alveolus, or intrusive, which means that the tooth is pushed into the alveolus. And then also a bulge, which is complete loss of the tooth out of the alveolus is possible. Um, so if the client, obviously we will treat this uh, patient on an emergency basis, meaning as if at all possible within three hours, first of all, if the client has noted the problem, and second of all, if we want to save the tooth, because if the client elects not to save the tooth, or if too much time has elapsed from the trauma, or if there are any other um, conditions that would prevent us from uh, doing several anesthesia in the several anesthesia in, anesthesia events in this animal, um, then we would obviously extract this tooth and suture the soft tissues over. But so if we decide that we will treat these periodontal trauma cases, then the first thing is to gently, gently debride the area, flush a lot, um, suture soft tissues, um, rain, pla rain plant the tooth, suture soft tissues, and then we need to um, somehow fix this tooth in the alveolus, especially if the alveolus is um, fractured, then this intraoral splint should be worn up to six weeks. If alveolus is not fractured, then they can wear it from three to four, uh, three to four weeks. Um, because um, blood supply to such tooth that was periodontally affected, uh, affected with trauma um, is compromised, these teeth will become non-vital and therefore root canal treatment has to be performed on these teeth. Um, and the sequel of events, it's usually at the time of trauma, we would reimplant the tooth and put in the splint. Then about three weeks later, we will do, two to three weeks later, we will do endodontic treatment, so root canal treatment. And then three, two to three weeks later, we will remove the splint. And then six months later, three to six months later, we will do radiographic recheck of the tooth. So it is absolutely, I think, important that the client is on board with all the sequel of events uh, if they decide to actually go and treat periodontal uh, trauma uh, in, in, in the patient. Obviously, if the, um, if the um, client declines or for whatever reason we decide against splinting the tooth and trying to keep it in the mouth, then we will obviously extract it. And again, extraction is not an emergency, but it should be performed again as soon as possible. And pain medications absolutely has to have to be uh, prescribed until the uh, extraction is performed. Um, what we do not do is we do not replant deciduous teeth, so we will just remove those. Um, and we have to know that prognosis is pretty poor for intrusive luxation because intrusive luxation, as we see on this left image here, is associated with an oral nasal fistula. We would also not replant treat teeth that are uh, affected, um, that were previously affected with periodontitis, um, like in this dog. Um, and as I mentioned, if the animal is anyhow not a good candidate for anesthesia, then we would probably uh, we would lean the client towards extraction because there are really several anesthetic events needed for these patients uh, for, for them to be completely worked up in, in, um, uh, in terms of their periodontal trauma treatment. Maxillofacial trauma uh, is most commonly seen in uh, young animals. Um, and causes may differ really greatly. Mostly, especially in cats, we do not really know 
why and uh, how it happened and when it happened. Um, many times a cat would just go missing, come back a few days later with obvious uh, trauma to the head. Um, so what do we do? First rule is stabilize the patient. Uh, maxillofacial trauma is very commonly associated with head trauma, with neurological damage, with ophthalmologic trauma, uh, and it may also be part of um, other polytrauma. So absolutely, we have to work these patients up and stabilize them uh, in general sense. Um, in terms of emergency treatment for maxillofacial trauma, when we talk about fractures uh, of the jaws, uh, we could simply place a muzzle, which can be either um, you know, pre-manufactured or um, made to fit um, muzzle. Uh, and this will, so basically what we do is we try to um, align the occlusion and then place the muzzle, and that will provide some support to the jaws until uh, we decide for the definitive treatment. Um, this can be, or this is usually the most common type of uh, taking care of maxillofacial trauma in juvenile patients, and I will come back to, back to this a bit later. Um, we absolutely need to provide a lot of pain, pain um, medication to these patients. Uh, if they cannot eat, we need to think about nutritional support, so uh, feeding tube. Antibiotic treatment is indicated if there are open fractures. Uh, and then once the patient is stable and once the patient was worked up uh, with a team approach, meaning uh, emergency service, uh, neurology, um, ophthalmology, um, any soft tissue surgery depends on what the other uh, trauma is. Um, then once the patient is stable, then we will go to anesthesia and uh, absolutely we recommend here advanced imaging. It was shown quite some time ago that uh, if we do skull radiographs, three view skull radiographs, uh, conventional radiographs, we will detect two to three times less um, fractures, injuries compared to CT. Um, and especially when it comes to TMJ trauma, so temporomandibular joint trauma, um, CT is absolutely superior in, in terms of diagnosing diseases there. Um, so what are we looking at? On CT, we will definitely see multiple skull fractures, which are commonly, especially in young animals, um, following the sutures and may be minimally displaced. Uh, we will commonly see also uh, nasal trauma and pharyngeal trauma. Um, and then what I said before, what is very important also in terms of prognosis is uh, the trauma to the temporomandibular joint. Um, and two most common types of trauma to the temporomandibular joint are the uh, fracture of the neck of the condyle as seen on the upper um, image. Um, and this is most commonly associated with, uh, uh, with some drift of the mandible. However, if the patient has, and that would be an extra articular fracture, uh, however, the other most common type is the fracture of the medial aspect of the condylar process, um, and that is an intra-articular um, fracture, which uh, is more commonly associated with uh, ankylosis of the temporomandibular joint, so that is prognostic value. Um, and also in this case, we may miss it if we just, if we just uh, evaluate the patient clinically, because with a small intra-articular intra fracture, usually there is no mandibular drift, no malocclusion, but despite the fracture being present. As I mentioned before, in juvenile animals, um, it has been shown in a few recent studies that uh, the best uh, actually uh, approach is to be very conservative. If we look at this CT, I mean, there is significant damage to the, the, to the bones, uh, but then there is no real way how to uh, fix this. Um, if we, we can't really think of any intra um or internal fixation methods because there are plenty of tooth buds developing, uh, developing there. So we will damage them and that's not okay. Um, if we want to use intraoral splints, we don't really have uh, enough spaces on the teeth because they are very small deciduous teeth. Um, so the best is just to provide um, to, to align the occlusion and then to provide some support with face masks. There is also, uh, they can be also a 3D printed so-called exoskeleton, which looks like a helmet, um, or uh, we can just simply place um, uh, a tape muzzle or a muzzle to keep the jaws in occlusion. Um, definitely, um, if there is um, severe uh, or there is um, pretty obvious, um, there are pretty obvious um, uh, fractures to the jaws, 
uh, we need to consider development of the jaws and these young patients will uh, commonly develop uh, malocclusion later on because of the uh, interference with jaw growth. And this patient may also have problems with teeth eruption depending uh, on the location of the fracture. So if two developing tooth buds were affected by the fracture, these teeth may not develop properly and may not erupt properly. Um, so yes, conservative uh, approach in juvenile animals is the way to go, but the client needs to be informed that these patients will need to be followed up later on, and if any uh, malocclusion develops, uh, we need to address that later in time. Um, sometimes we, you know, in, in our eagerness to help our patients, we may be a bit too eager and jump into procedures a bit too early. Um, and um, some physical separation is one of such injuries. It's very obvious, it's there, we can see it, and we would all like to address it as, you know, as of now. But the fact is, okay, first stabilize the patient, because again, these are head trauma patients, and they need, you need to be sure that they are stable for anesthesia. And then even if symphysial separation looks like as the only injury on the head, um, it's very rarely so. Most, common, uh, most commonly associated um, um, injuries with uh, symphysial separation are actually uh, temporomandibular joint fractures and injuries. So we will always recommend uh, CT also in these cases to evaluate thoroughly the uh, maxillofacial area, TMJ, uh, for any concomitant injuries. And then we will uh, continue with our treatment. Um, when it comes to treatments of maxillofacial trauma and um, jaw fractures, um, what we all aim to is functionality of these patients uh, and functionality kind of basically equals occlusion is normal, they can prehend food, food normally. Um, so if we achieve, like in this case, that was a symphysial separation case, very simple, yeah, we would say, we did cerclage wire on this case, but that slipped somewhere during the, uh, the healing process. Um, and the, the, the symphysis healed in, um, in a malocclusion. Um, and that is not successful treatment. Yes, the symphysis has healed, but obviously we have malocclusion here with uh, mandibular, uh, so left mandibular canine tooth rubbing towards left maxillary third incisor tooth. So we have to address this. We can't really leave it as is. And again, one of the most simple things here is to, to do is to extract the tooth that is actually causing malocclusion. And in this particular case, instead of extracting mandibular canine, we would elect, because it's le much less invasive, we would elect to extract maxillary third incisor tooth. Um, and we may decide to leave the um, jaws as they are healed rather than go and uh, re uh, recreate the symphysial separation and uh, do another cerclage. Um, very commonly um, in maxillofacial trauma patients, we will also see um, soft tissue injuries, lip avulsion injuries. Again, uh, young animals are overrepresented. Uh, and for this, if the patient is stable, uh, immediate treatment is recommended. Um, soft tissue injuries, soft tissues tend to shrink, tend to get uh, infected, and the, uh, and, um, the histence is um, pretty common. Um, so if at all possible, we should treat these um, soft tissue injuries as soon as possible. Uh, with a copious lavage, uh, debridement, appositional repair, and support with anti analgetic analgesia and antibiotics. So if we look at this cat, um, she had a severe uh, deglaving injury, so lip avulsion injury bilateral of the lower lip. Uh, we would absolutely recommend uh, CT here to evaluate also for potential other maxillofacial trauma and fractures. Um, and then once we uh, once we once the animal is stable and stable and worked up up, um, we would debride this area. So we would do a lot of uh, flushing and uh, debridement of the soft tissues until we get nicely bleeding tissues. You can see I did also here some uh, small, um, literally drillings in the uh, cortical bone of the mandible. Absolutely not through and through and not to the roots and not to the inferior al uh, alveolar artery and nerve, so mandibular canal, but just monocortically to actually get some bleeding out of the bone so that this will enable uh, healing in the area. Then our first sutures are really just appositional uh, with um, resorbable material. We will oppose this lip to the 
uh, mucogingival junction, that is actually where the lipovulsion usually happens. But this is not obviously not enough. So this is just to oppose the tissues. And then the, the real work is done actually from this sling or hanging sutures. Um, so these are nylon sutures and we literally go from the skin on the chin uh, into the mouth around the tooth or teeth also premolars and then again out on the skin on the chin which actually hangs the tissue on the tooth or on the mandibles. Um, and we would leave that like this for two to three weeks. Uh, and then this is the same cats two weeks later. Um, and at that point, we on a conscious animal, usually they allow us, we would just uh, cut off these nylon sutures and the soft tissues should be healed and remain in place. Uh, similar applies to palatal separation repair. So this is uh, not only soft tissue injury, but also a separation of the palatine uh, of the palatine processes of the maxilla. Um, and again, if we delay, uh, if it's all possible, we should do it as soon as possible immediately. Um, if we need to delay the, uh, the treatment, these uh, lesions can heal pretty fast and oronasal fistula can, um, can be created. Um, so as if it's possible in terms of stability of the patient for general anesthesia, we would go in immediately. Uh, and what we need to do is we literally need to squeeze the maxilla together because they are separated. So that would be a proper, purely physical mechanical action. Um, and then it, if it is possible, so we would just gently debride the, uh, the soft tissues. And if it possible, we can suture these just by um, uh, uh, like per, per, per prima. Yeah? Uh, if there is any tension on the suture line, then we need to do one or two releasing incisions into the soft palate, into the um, soft tissues of the hard palate, uh, a millimeter of two or two away from the teeth, and do two sliding flaps that will be opposed without tension on the midline over the uh, hard defect. And we leave these two in releasing incisions to heal by second intention to granulate in. Uh, palatal separation can uh, can be um, can affect only actually the incisive area, so the in incisive suture, or it can be associated with what we just saw before, so with the through and through defect on the palatine suture. Uh, in this case, again, we can see on this image that there is oronasal communication because of the separation of the uh, incisive bones. Uh, and we can also see this gap on this radiograph. So again, what we would do here, it will, we would again squeeze them the ma manually um, the maxilla together, and we would suture the soft tissues. Uh, and on top of that, we would do some intraoral splint. Uh, this is so-called wire reinforced intraoral splint, composite splint. Um, in a we would go with a wire in a figure of eight around the canine teeth, and then cover that wire with composite. Um, and that would also keep the maxilla together in, um, in, and not uh, allow them to, to spread again. Uh, it is absolutely important that before we wake up these patients, we check the occlusion and our device must not interfere with um, occlusion. And then high-rise syndrome in cats is actually a complex of all what we talk now. So high-rise syndrome, uh, again, usually happens in young animals that they want to go out and then they fall from heights. Uh, and oral maxillofacial manifestation um, is seen in 60% of these uh, animals. Uh, otherwise, that is polytrauma with internal organ injury, orthopedic injury, um, so, other soft tissue injuries, neurological trauma, and so on. So when it comes to oromaxillofacial manifestations, um, we will see all combinations of what we, what we talked. Palatal separation, symphysia separation, jaw fractures, EMJ injuries, uh, soft tissue injuries, avulsions, dental trauma, uh, periodontal trauma. So it's really, these are really complex cases cases, um, and we should just combine all the approaches that we talked about previously. And then when it comes to TMJ, not only TMJ trauma, but um, here and there, it's not very common, but here and there, we will um, get in the patients with inability to open or close the mouth. Um, and these are usually, these are not all cases that will need an emergency treatment because of the 
the, the, the disease that caused the inability to close or open the mouth. But the problem is that just inability to close or open the mouth per se is extremely frustrating and it may also be very painful depending on the cause uh, for, for this inability to close and open the mouth. Um, so one of the causes is absolutely maxillofacial trauma, TMJ, injury, luxation, or, or um, congenital dysplasia. Uh, or on the other hand, we may have open mouth jaw locking, which is commonly associated with some developmental abnormalities. Uh, and what happens in open mouth jaw locking is that the when the dog or cat yawns, for example, opens mouth widely, the, uh, the coronoid process will jump out and get stuck on the lateral aspect of the zygomatic arch. Um, so these are two conditions that relate to the uh, TMJ and um, zygomatic area. Then, of course, animals may be unable to close the mouth if there are foreign bodies stuck somewhere, if the tumors has, uh, have uh, grown into considerably. considerably. Um, Cyanocyons, especially large ranulas, may prevent uh, closing the mouth. And then trigeminal neuropathy. Um, and this is the only one where we can actually manually close the mouth without the animal um, uh, experiencing any pain. So trigeminal neuropathy, it's quite easily diagnosed. So the patient comes with inability to close the mouth and the mandibles are just hanging down. And we can just literally nicely close the mouth back into occlusion without any resistance, without any pain. Um, so then again, we have to go deeper and uh, find out what is causing trigeminal neuropathy. Um, and once if, uh, let's say, if the reason is uh, for, um, uh, for either TMJ luxation or open mouth jaw locking is uh, actually, uh, if, if, that is, if these are the reasons to, uh, to, for inability to close the mouth, we have to correct this, uh, this condition manually. Ideally, we have a CT before so that we know how we are correcting. Ideally, we also do a CT after the correction so that we know that everything is correctly in place. But these conditions tend to relapse then. Um, and to prevent that, we have to somehow uh, assure some maxillomandibular fixation. Uh, and one of such, uh, such approaches in cats, um, and it's also useful for caudal mandibular fractures in cats, is labial buttons. So what we do in this case is, is actually we to put two buttons on upper lips and one on the chin and connect them like a V-shape and leave just about a centimeter between incisors. So just enough that animals can lick and this cat is actually eating on recovery. We obviously always place a feeding tube in these animals because um, just in case if they don't go and immediately eat. Um, and these um, labial buttons uh, is actually kind of a semi-rigid maxillomedibular fixation um, that can be quite useful and in my own experience also very well tolerated in cats despite being such a uh, you know such a kind of primitive um, uh, procedure but actually it's it's well accepted and then on the other hand inability to open the mouth again uh, several reasons are possible for it uh, it can be related to TMJ ankylosis it can be related to masticatory myositis middle ear disease foreign bodies tumors retrobulbar abscesses so many reasons can cause inability to open the mouth and that is why it's again so important that we do advanced imaging in these patients before we go into any uh, treatment planning and prognostication uh, because obviously treatments and prognosis in these patients may vary greatly. And finally, uh, patients can also suffer from burns in the oral cavity. This can be either chemical or electrical. Um, and again, uh, if these, pa these patients absolutely, if they survive, they absolutely need an extensive medical support, um, conservative treatment. So the oral cavity is kind of just wait and see. We would obviously provide a lot of analgesics. In these cases, if the, if the lesions are extensive, we would also uh, put them on antibiotics, uh, su uh, supportive uh, feeding. Um, and we would just wait and see what happens because usually these uh, lesions uh, will demarcate greatly within a few days or even weeks. And if we go in too early, we may not, we may just not do anything. Um, so basically wait and see with conservative support and then um, uh, we may need to uh, surgically uh, correct some defects that remain once the tissues have healed.
And with this, I would like to thank you. And if there are any questions, I'm absolutely happy to take them. That's fantastic. Thank you, Anna. Um, so if you've got any questions, um, please put them in the chat. I thought that talk was brilliant. It's something that I've seen in practice so many times, facial trauma, and so many different ways to sort of manage it. Um, so it's really, really, really useful for me. Thank you. And we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. So sorry, put them in the q and I'll keep an eye on the chat as well. And um, probably what I'll do, I'll just read them out, actually. Yeah. Um, that's OK. So the first one um, from Alexandre Dinu, uh, and I think this is a really good one, um, with an infected, with an old infected lip avulsion, um, those sort of dirty ones that you get after a few days, um, how should we proceed? Um, I would still recommend proceeding as we discussed. So um, we need to debride that um, that uh, that lesion, that area, um, with copious lavage and uh, blunt dissection of non-vital, uh, especially non-vital and uh, contaminated tissues. Um, and then it really depends how much the tissues have already shrunk, but it um, it never helps if we try to suture everything perfectly back in place. So I would still recommend after we debride it, everything very meticulously and carefully support these patients with a lot of analgesia and uh, we would normally use here broad spectrum antibiotics um, and then try to somehow oppose the tissues back to the bone. Um, and again, slink or hanging sutures come really handy in this situation. And absolutely, as I mentioned before, even if these lesions are addressed um, immediately, there is still pretty high, about 20% failure rate, so the histance rate. Um, and if these are old and infected lesions, we may, uh, we may eventually um, end up with even higher the histance rate, longer healing, several debridements, and possibly at, um, at some stage, also some advanced surgical flapping techniques to cover the defects. That's great, yeah. Okay, the second question we have um, is one around periodontal trauma and root canal. So um, can you eventually combine removing the splint in periodontal trauma and root canal, or is it necessarily to do the root canal after three weeks? So I think that's once you remove yeah. a split, you do a root canal straight away. Absolutely. I mean, there depends on what type of trauma is. Sometimes we would we would remove the splint earlier. If there is no alveolar fracture. We can combine it with that. Uh, the other option that uh, some colleagues uh, would also do, or we would also do, uh, but we have whatsoever no literature on it to support it, is that at the time of event of actual trauma, so at the time of splinting, we would remove the pulp and just place in calcium hydroxide paste as a tem as a temporary field. So that is what we would do also, for example, in humans when we place medication right in the tooth. So we would just uh, we would just um, take out the pulp, um, briefly debride the canal because it's very difficult to work on that uh, uh, unhealthy, um, basically periodontally affected tooth. Um, and just placing calcium hydroxide paste, uh, which is then flushed out and root canal treatment eventually done in, yeah, in, at the splint removal. Right. Yeah, but we, we have literally on periodontal trauma, we don't really have much data. It's so rarely done that we wouldn't really have much data on the outcomes, on the success. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just... Um, go with what is considered the gold standard in humans and then evaluate treatment um, as, as per each individual patient and client. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and we've got a couple of thanks, one from Melissa Ziegler saying, thank you, it was really good. She's um, doing her dentistry certificate and it was really good revision and just a few people saying thank you. I've got a couple of questions actually. Um, I was sort of trained as a surgeon, I suppose, in, in, my, in my previous role. Um, obviously we're, taught you know to rationally use antibiotics what, what what's your what would you use how when how long with antibiotics in um, dental trauma so if we in dental trauma per se we would actually not really use it so if we have let's say I mentioned uh, complicated crown fracture. If we do vital pulpectomy, we would just uh, prescribe non-steroidals. Non-steroidals are the, um, how to say, the primary treatment uh, for pain control in, in oral and dental diseases. Um, and we would not prescribe antibiotics. 
Um, then when it comes to say extraction for dental trauma, either not. Um, and then when it comes to abscesses, again, um, if the, I mentioned it before, if the patient is having a localized uh, infection with a draining tract um, and we extract the tooth, that's, that's the, you know, the, the, the treatment, right? So we don't really need any antibiotics. The only potential cases where we would use antibiotics are the cases with really fast developing swellings, uh, acute infections, spread infections, if we cannot address, if we can't address them immediately, or if they show uh, systemic signs like lethargy, pyrexia, leukocytosis. But then again, we have to address also the, the cause of it. Um, and then when it comes to periodontal trauma, periodontal trauma is still an indication for using antibiotics perioperatively and postoperatively for seven days. Um, and we would also use antibiotics in open fractures and in um, soft tissue injuries. Um, and now we would, in these cases, we would go with a broad spectrum antibiotic. Usually that is amoxicillin clavulanic acid uh, or clindamycin or sometimes metronidazole, but mostly amoxicillin clavulanic acid for these conditions that what I was talking about. Um, in some cases where infections are spread, where bone is um, visibly affected in uh, terms of osteomyelitis, we have to do bone biopsy. Um, and submit a biopsy sample for culture and sensitivity because we expect them four to six weeks of treatment. Um, so that is absolutely necessary to biopsy and send the sample in. Yeah, great. Okay, we've got a few more questions. Um, so one's regarding the palatal separation and sort of what, what's the dehiscence rate for um, repair of palatal separation? Palatal separation. So, uh, there, there was recently a study coming out from University of Pennsylvania, and you got me with exact number. I, I don't have <laughs> it uh, in my in my mind. I can absolutely share the paper with you later, and you can distribute it. But if it's done without tension, complication rate. Uh, if it's done as soon as possible, if it uh, su if it's sutured without tension, then this uh, percentage is absolutely very low, and the long term outcome is very good. Right. Um, and um, Matthew Visser asked about um, vital pulp capping. Um, do you do vital pulp capping in adult animals with complicated crown fractures at an age where the apex is closed, or would you prefer to do a root canal treatment to prevent the chance of pulpitis after treatment? That has long been, uh, or it's still a debate. And when I was a resident 10 years ago, uh, it was the uh, the routine that we did uh, pulpectomy, vital pulpectomy as an emergency procedure, and then eventually followed up with a root canal uh, when the, especially in young animals, where we just wanted the apex to, to develop, to form. Uh, and yes, we would avoid vital pulp therapy in major teeth. But then with more cases coming in um, and with success, a success rate of vital pulpectomy was, the, the data I showed you actually stem from only one study so far. So we are looking for more studies. Um, and in that study, actually, if you look, if you look at specific data, uh, it was done in mature and immature teeth. Uh, and also uh, in some cases, it was done even later than 48 hours. Um, so it's not that what black and white. And we would nowadays, even in older animals, unless the canal is super small, where it's technically difficult to do a good vital pulpectomy, we would also consider doing vital pulpectomy. Um, checking the animals in three to six months and then decide um, how, how the procedure went. And if we clearly see the, the signs of continuous vitality of the tooth, especially if we have healthy contralateral tooth which, to which we can compare our treated tooth, um, then nowadays we would leave it as is and we would not go in uh, and do the root canal treatment. Right. Uh, another quick question on antibiotics, actually, which I think is really, really relevant. Mm, yeah. Um, Please, could you advise uh, if you would prescribe antibiotics during a post-operative period after routine extractions following a scale and polish to address periodontal disease? So would you use antibiotics? No. And that was actually re recently um, a small, more or less a pilot study came out on, uh, on bacteremia during procedures in uh, otherwise healthy patients. Um, and the, as we agree now, uh, if we are working on a, on a systemically healthy patient, 
regardless the number of extractions, we would not use antibiotics perioperatively and even less postoperatively. So absolutely, we would not, uh, we would not uh, recommend using routinely. Then again, we have to consider cases that are not systemically healthy. Uh, for example, cases um, with um, uncontrolled diabetes, those may have issues with healing. But then again, if at all possible, we would stabilize the patient first systemically and then do dental procedure, which is not urgent. Um, so generally antibiotic use has, was, or have been really minimized in dental patients. And we are talking about very selective, very selective cases uh, that uh, that require perioperative and even less that require postoperative antibiotic treatment. Yeah. It's an absolutely interesting and important topic. Yeah. Okay. I think we, we had one other question around how do you manage things um, in financially constrained owners, but I'm I'm not too sure what that refers to. But I think I might just add to that. Certainly, when I was in practice, um, we didn't have access to advanced imaging. And one of the challenging things I found was the, particularly the cat that comes in with the open mouth and you've ruled out a foreign body, you've ruled out an intraoral tumour, xylocele and everything like that. How do you advise that um, we can manage that in a general practitioner setting where we don't have advanced imaging and what strategies, I know it's a big topic, but what strategies would you do to sort of assess that? So in particularly in cats with those open mouths. I mean, if... Uh... See, as, I, as I mentioned, most of the maxillofacial trauma cases are not really emergency, emergency that would need to be worked up immediately. Um, so if, if the finances are not of a concern, that I will absolutely consider referral for advanced imaging um, and then go take it from there. Um, if the finances are really limited, and it happens to us as well, obviously, uh, what we would do is we would go with what we see clinically. Uh, and we would try to be minimally invasive with our um, treatment approaches. Um, and mostly in such cats, I would uh, try to fix the occlusion back into normal occlusion. Um, and those are the cases where I like to actually use the uh, labial button techniques because I don't want any particular rigid fixation because I don't know what is happening with the TMJ. And if we somehow fix um, fix the jaws in, uh, you know, with like, let's say if we bond the canine teeth together with, and that would be rigid fixation, um, that is less um, kind of less natural for the healing of the temporomandibular joint. So then if I don't have the full data, then I would go by my clinical judgment, try to employ um, minimally invasive techniques. And obviously the client has to know that uh, we may end up with some consequences later, TMJ ankylosis, uh, if we didn't really select the correct uh, treatment. Um, Skull radiographs are of a limited value, uh, and if finances are really that limited, then probably by the time we do, um, depends again on the setting, but if finances are limited, then doing three or four views um, skull radiographs, we are almost at the, at the price of um, maybe Combim City. Um, so yeah, all this has to be considered. And if the finances are really limited, we would just go by clinical judgment and let the client know that we may run into issues later on. That's great. Hope it somehow makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So I think we'll wrap up there. Um, so thank you, Anna. Really good talk, really practical talk. And hopefully people can take a lot to manage in practice. Just um, a couple of things. Everyone's going to get a recording of a webinar. So you've all registered. So don't worry, that will come through. If you've got any questions around this, please just let us know and we can um, we can answer your questions. We've got um, webinars coming up every two weeks. The next one is Tuesday. They're always at Tuesday at this time. Uh, the next one's with Elsa Bartram, our neurologist um, on vestibular disease, vestibular syndrome. So that should be really interesting. Um, and yes, use use uh, use our specialists if you can. Um, you can try us just with one case. You don't have to, you know, you can just try us with a case. Um, visit our website. We'll send you some links as well. We really look forward to working with you guys in practice. And uh, thank you very much for attending today. And hopefully we'll see you soon. So thank you. Thank you.